Hi there. Welcome back to 2.6 of our online VT prep course. Uh, still in anatomy and physiology, but this lecture will be on the nervous system. So the body's systems, they need to communicate and they need to be controlled and coordinated. And um, there's two communication and control systems that help this happen. It's our endocrine system and our nervous system. So we just did the lecture on the endocrine system and now we're gonna focus on the nervous system. So both of these systems do use chemicals to communicate. The nervous system's chemical messenger are neurotransmitters, whereas the endocrine system um, the chemical messenger were hormones that were made from all of these different types of glands and organs, but our nervous system is actually neurotransmitters, and that is the chemical messengers that help our nervous system. So the nervous system monitors what's going on inside and outside of our body, and there's two main divisions for our nervous system. There's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So um, before we get talking about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and then its subcategories, we're going to go right down to the neuron, which is the basic functional unit of every single bit of nervous tissue within the body. It all stems from this one beautiful cell called the neuron. So it's the basic functional unit of the nervous system, and it has a very high requirement for oxygen. In the last PowerPoint, we talked about the importance for, um, for oxygen to be delivered to all our cells and tissues in our body so that they can um, do their work. They need oxygen for that. So neurons specifically have a very high requirement for oxygen. Um, and, and they can't reproduce, okay? So the, so the neurons, they can't reproduce. So that's why once neurological system cells are damaged, there's no recuperating. For example, stroke victims and spinal cord damage, if they get damage done to their neurons, it, it can't fix itself. So that's why that damage always ends up being permanent. Um, there is something called a neuroglia, which is also termed as a glial cell, and it provides structural and functional support and protection to the neuron. And we're gonna show you pictures of this. But these glial cells are kind of like the bodyguard for these neurons, they protect them. These here are examples of glial cells. So there's different types of glial cells. This, is, um, this image is showing you one neuron, so the yellow is the one neuron and this these blue and pinkish purple cells are glial cells and they help support the neuron and protect it so let's talk about the neuron and its structure so there's a central cell body or a soma or a, peri a perikaryon. So um, again, just to make your life difficult, there's gonna be six different names for one same thing. But um, this is what we're talking about here. This is the cell's central body, okay? The cell's body. And then there's processes coming off of it. So there's processes up here and there's processes down here. Process just means a protrusion of some sort off of something, right? So these are dendrites. These are the processes that come up off the cell body. These are dendrites. And then this long tail is the axon. And the dendrites receive information from something and the axon will take that information and bring it all the way down to the tail and spit it to the next axon or sorry, the next neuron that's waiting right here. So the dendrites, they receive stimulation from other neurons and conduct the stimuli to the cell body. So if we're, if, if we're looking at the cell up here, it's receiving messages. Those messages actually happen to be that chemical, um, chemical um, messenger that I was telling you about. And those were neurotransmitters, remember, okay? And so um, these neurotransmitters come down here and stimulate these dendrites to send the message to the cell body, which is right here. And um, they may serve uh, as sensory receptors for heat, cold, touch, pressure, stretch, or other physical changes from outside or inside the body. And um, so that's what they do, is they're sensory receptors that will sense whether something's hot, cold, whether we can feel touch, pressure, stretch, whatever. Um, they're short, 
and there's numerous multi and they're numerous and they're multi branched as you can see in this picture. So this again is just showing you one beautiful neuron and the processes up at the top are the dendrites. So they grab onto the message and bring it to the cell so that it can be interpreted and sent down further. Moving on to the tail of the neuron, which is the other process um, extension from that cell, it conducts the nerve impulse away from the cell body towards another neuron or an effector cell. So basically what that means is that the dendrites are going to grab onto the message and bring that message down into the cell body and then from the cell body that message or that nerve impulse is then going to travel down that tail. It's going to travel down the axon and it's going to make its way to the next cell that's going to receive the message. Now that next cell could be another neuron, right? Because if you think of, if I touch a burning stove, there's going to be one neuron touching another neuron, touching another neuron all the way up to my brain. So that message is received or to my spinal cord. Um, so neuron, they kind of, they're not directly attached, but they're kind of back to back all the way up to where the message needs to go. Or it could be an effector cell. So if there's a message being sent saying, take away your hand because that's really hot, that effector cell is going to be the last cell that's going to receive that message that's going to make me take away my hand. Okay. So the axon is a single long process. It may be covered with myelin. Okay, so if you guys noticed in all these pictures that we've been seeing, this axon, they have these like these coverings all down their axon. And that's all that's called myelin. Not all axons have myelin, but a lot of them do. So this myelin sheath, okay, so this covering of myelin around the axon, um, myelin sheath around neurons in the central nervous system is made up from cell membranes of the oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocyte is a glial cell. Okay, so remember we talked about glial cells being the bodyguards for these axons. So an oligodendrocyte is one of those bodyguards. It's a glial cell. So in the central nervous system, these myelin sheaths, these myelin coverings that we're seeing around the axon is actually from the cell membrane of the oligodendrocyte, the glial cell. It'll take its own cell membrane and wrap itself around the axon to protect it. While the myelin around nerves in the peripheral nervous system is made up from glial cell membrane of the Schwann cell. So the Schwann cell and the oligodendrocyte are two different types of bodyguards for these neurons. Okay, so they're two different kinds of glial cells, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Each one of those will wrap themselves around the axon to protect it. Um, oligodendrocytes take charge in the central nervous system and then Schwann cells will take charge in the peripheral nervous system. So the myelinated axon conducts impulses faster than unmyelinated ones. So like I said, some axons don't have this myelin sheath covering its axon. Um, and if they don't have that myelin sheath, the um, impulse is going to take a lot longer to get through this neuron. Whereas the myelinated ones, it zooms right through that axon super quick, thanks to that myelin sheath. And it's very important to understand that in between each one of these sections that are wrapped up, there's going to be a little tiny space here, and that's called the nodes of Ranvier. And these are gaps between each glial cell. Okay, so remember, these are the glial cells that are wrapping themselves around the axon. In between each one of these, and I think there's a better picture coming up, um, there's a little tiny gap, and it's called the nodes of Ranvier. So this right here is exactly showing you that. So we have a beautiful neuron here. We have our dendrites where the impulse comes in through here, makes its way to the cell body. And then the message will then go down this tail, which is the axon, right? Now this axon has myelin sheaths, okay? So, so they, they have these coverings all around it. And see how it's twisted up around there? That's actually the glial cells, um, glial cell membrane, and it wraps wraps itself around it to protect it. But in between these, there's a little tiny gap, and these are called the nodes of Ranvier. So remember how I said myelinated axons will send a message faster than an unmyelinated axon? That's because the message that's coming down here actually hops and goes to here, and hops and goes to here, and hops and goes to here, and hops and goes to here. And so that 
um, allows it to not have to travel all the way through here. And when we talk about action potentials and what that is involved in, you'll appreciate how it can move so much faster if it doesn't have to go through that action potential all the way through here, the, where the myelinated sheaths are. So um, the Schwann cell, okay, so that's the glial cell, the bodyguard, um, and, and that takes care of the neurons that are in the PNS, in the peripheral nervous system. So the Schwann cells are the bodyguards for the axons there, and they take their own cell membrane and wrap themselves around the axon to, pro excuse me, to protect it. So you can see the axon running here, and then this is the Schwann cell, and it wraps and wraps and wraps and wraps itself all the way around the axon, okay, causing that, and it makes that myelin sheath and this is an oligodendrocyte which is the bodyguards for the neurons in the central nervous system so the oligodendrocytes will take their cell wall and wrap and wrap and wrap themselves around the axon of the neurons in the central nervous system and this image is showing you just that so how does the neuron work? Now, this, this, the nervous system just blows my mind and it's, it can be very challenging to understand how it works, okay? So I encourage you guys for this nervous system um, and how the neurons work is to do your own reading within your book um, and also watch the videos that we had watched in class because that will really help you understand um, the function of all this because it can get a little overwhelming. And how cool is this picture? So the neuron cell wall. Okay, so to understand how a neuron works, we have to understand the anatomy of the neuron. So we know the anatomy of it as far as dendrites, body, axon, whatever. But we let's go even deeper into the neuron. And remember, the neuron is a cell. So the neuron cell wall. So we have to talk about the wall of the neuron itself. So um, the, the, the lipid Bilayer. So it has a lipid bilayer like you can see in this picture here. Okay, so it has one layer of lipids up here and one layer of lipids down here. So in here we're talking about inside the neuron. Right here we're talking about outside the neuron. Okay, so this is through the neuronal wall. And um, so it, the, the lipid bilayer is a thin polar membrane made up of two layers of lipid molecules, okay, as you can see in this picture. These membranes are uh, flat sheets that form a continuous barrier around the cell. Now, these this lipid bilayer is impermeable to ions. So what that means is um, when the ions need to cross the membrane, and you're going to understand in a few slides why these ions have to pass it, but when they do need to, they actually need to do this through a channel or a pump. <coughs> Excuse me. And these channels or pumps that are going to be um, in the cell wall to help these ions move from the inside out or vice versa. These are actually proteins that are embedded in this membrane. And you're going to understand that in the next few PowerPoint in, in the next few slides. So this cell wall cannot let ions go through it. The only way ions can get in or out of the cell and these ions need to transport in and out of the cell. They have to, but the only way they can do that is if they cross a channel or a pump. And these are actually proteins that are stuck or embedded in this bilayer that's gonna help with that transportation. So this right here, again, um, within the bilayers, there's channels and pumps, like I just told you, and these generate and control intracellular versus extracellular concentration of ions. So please try your best to stay, stay with me here. I know it can be challenging, but like I said, for an impulse or a message to travel down a neuron, the only way that happens is if ions go from in and out of the cell. That's the only way. 
Okay, that's the basic understanding of it. So a message is to be sent, and the only way that message can be sent is if these ions, like sodium ions and potassium ions, um, this right here, these blue circles are potassium ions, and the um, purple ones are the sodium ions, the only way that message can go down is if these sodium ions go in and out of the cell. Okay, and the only way that this can happen is through... Um, these channels in pumps so these big blue proteins that are to the right and left of this um, this lipid bilayer here those will help the potassium and the sodium go um, in or out of the cell and then the middle purple one is a protein that's called the sodium potassium pump and that will make sure that everybody is where they need to be and they'll keep control of things so okay this is where things can get a little bit dicey. So how does the neuron work? Okay, and we have to understand its resting state first. I have some YouTube links here for you and I suggest you view these videos to try to help you wrap your brain around this, but I will do my best. So the resting state of the neuron is when it's not being stimulated. Absolutely nothing is happening to that neuron. There is no message that needs to be sent, okay? So during that resting state, there is a resting membrane potential. So what this means is that that neuron has a difference in electrical charge across the neuron, neuronal cell membrane. That means the electrical charge inside the cell is different from the electrical charge outside the cell. That is what's happening with that neuron when it's just chilling and relaxing, okay? But it's kind of funny because the, the neuron works very hard to maintain that resting state. So it's kind of like an oxymoron. I don't know. They call it a resting state because there's no message being sent. Although that neuron is still working really, really hard to maintain that resting state membrane potential. So there's a higher concentration of sodium extracellular. So that means outside the neuron, there's going to be a lot of sodium ions. And inside the cell, there's going to be a lot of potassium ions. And the, it needs to stay that way during its mess, resting state. Okay, that is just when it's resting and it's chilling. To maintain that resting membrane potential, there's going to be a different in electrical charge outside to inside that neuron. Outside, there's a lot of sodium. Inside, there's a lot of potassium. So results from differences in distribution of positive on the outside of the cell, because Na um, will create that positive charge, and negative charges on the inside of the um, and negative charge on the inside from the sodium, potassium, protein, and other charges, charged ions on either side of the neuronal membrane. So again, it's going to be positively charged on the outside. It's going to be negatively charged on the inside. This is what's happening when the neuron is just chilling and relaxing. And it works really freaking hard to make that happen. So it's funny that it's called the resting membrane potential because it's the, the wall of that neuron is not resting. It's working very hard. So continuing on with the resting state, some channels, so sodium or potassium, are open and ions can move passively in and out. Because ions are always going to want to migrate towards the opposite charge. So a positive ion is always going to want to move to a negative charge. And a negative ion is always going to want to move to a positive charge. So while it's chilling and relaxing, and there's a difference of electricity between the outside and the inside of this neuron, the outside being positive, the inside being negative, there's some of these channels that are completely open. So these ions are just going to passively make their way from the outside to the inside or vice versa. So this changes the electrical charge. And this is why the neuron works so hard to maintain its resting membrane potential because this is happening and it's really annoying, but they have to constantly be fixing it to maintain their resting state, okay? So at the resting state, the charge needs to be negative intracellularly and positive extracellularly. We have to remember that. But because these ions are passively, passively moving through these channels, the NAK, the sodium potassium pump, will put them back to their original place. So that's what the pump does. So it moves sodium out of the cell and it moves potassium back into the cell 
to maintain the charge that we need at that resting state. So that is what's going on while the neuron is relaxing. You can only imagine what happens when it's not relaxing. But during its resting state, it has a resting membrane potential. That means outside the cell is positively charged, inside the cell is negatively charged. But these channels, sodium and potassium channels that are embedded in this wall are open. So these positive ions are going to migrate to where it's negative and the negative ions are going to migrate to where it's positive. And that can be annoying for the cell, but thank God we have our sodium potassium pump that will put everybody back to where they need to be to maintain the positive on the outside and the negative on the inside. This is a picture showing you that, okay? So um, we have, um, this is outside the cell and this is inside the cell, okay? So when the cell membrane is resting, there's gonna be these channels that are just open. Now sodium's hanging out at, out here and it's gonna wanna leak down in, okay? Passively. And then we have our potassium which is just passively going to leak its way out. And then this, this pump right here is going to go, wait a minute, like we're not where we need to be here. So it's actually going to start transferring that sodium back out to where it's supposed to be and the potassium back in to where it needs to be so that we can maintain a positive charge out here and a negative charge down here. That is all happening when the neuron is at rest. Okay, now all of a sudden the neuron's not resting anymore. Something happens that's called depolarization. And this means that there is a message. So the neuron has to do something and bring that message all the way up to where it needs to go, okay? So what happens is the neuron receives an external stimulation. I put my hand on a hot stove, um, someone touches my hand, or I eat a yummy piece of pizza. These are all stimuli, stimulation, and it's gonna cause our neurons to fire, okay? They get a message and they send it somewhere to, for it to be analyzed. So to for the heat to be analyzed as hey dummy take your hand off the stove it's hot or touch oh someone's touching me on the shoulder i should turn around and look at who it is or mm, this pizza is so good i want more these are all different stimulations that make their way to the brain or the spinal cord to give us a reaction take your hand off turn around and look at who's touching you or eat more pizza okay these are all desired responses um, to the stimuli so what happens is the stimulation causes depolarization. What happens is that there's sodium channels that are gonna open and the sodium just dumps right into the cell membrane. And remember when we were talking about at that resting state, there's more sodium on the outside and there's more potassium on the inside. But when we get a stimulation, the sodium gate opens and it all dumps in the cell. Sodium ions will flow into the cell by passive diffusion because passive uh, positive ions are going to be attractive to, attracted to um, negative ions. So it's going to make its way into that negative charge, I should say, that's inside the cell. So right here is what happens. What happens is the action potential. And what the action potential is, is a temporary reversal of charge. Now remember, at a resting state, that neuron is positive on the outside, negative on the inside. But when we have an action potential and everything depolarizes, it switches. And so it's negative on the outside of the cell and positive on the inside of the cell and that is an action potential. So during depolarization, inside the neuron goes from a negative charge um, from the resting membrane potential to a positive charge due to the sodium just dumping into the cell, and then it just makes the cell positive. This creates a large change in electrical charge from a negative to positive, okay? Then after that, what's gonna happen is repolarization. So a fraction of a second after those sodium channels open and all the sodium dump in, they quickly snap shut. It's only a fraction of a second that that happens. So it's amazing how much sodium flows through that channel into the neuron to make a positive charge on the inside. It's only a fraction of a second and then that door is closed. 
But right then, the potassium channels are going to be opening and the potassium is going to start diffusing outside of the cell. And what's really cool is that the resting state is then restored. So by the potassium cells going outside of the cell and the sodium going, uh, the potassium is going to say, listen, we just, you know, totally switched our electrical charge. I'm getting out of here because I need to make the outside positive and help get this inside negative again. And that's exactly what happens after the sodium dumps in, that sodium channel will snap shut and the potassium is going to open and all the potassium is going to dump outside of the cell, restoring the resting state. So it repolarizes, except now all the potassium is on the outside, not all, but most of the potassium is on the outside and most of the sodium is on the inside. That's the complete opposite of what we started with. So we have to fix that. Okay. So even though we've restored our charge um, and our resting membrane potential, the ions are on opposite sides of the cell. Okay. And how are we going to fix that? So as repolarization ends and we've, we've gotten our resting membrane potential back to where it needs to be, that's great. The sodium potassium pump moves sodium and potassium ions back to their original sites. Okay, so at the end of repolarization, which is all the potassium goes flowing out to accommodate for the change in charge because of the sodium all dumping inside the cell, the potassium makes its way back out. So then it becomes negative um, on the inside of the cell and positive on the outside of the cell again, which is great. That's what we want. But all these ions are on the opposite sides. And thanks to the sodium potassium pump, it will... Um, it will switch everybody back to their proper sides. So there's something called a threshold stimulus. The stimulus must be sufficient to make a neuron respond and cause a complete depolarization. If the stimulus is insufficient, the information from that dendrite will never make its way to the brain because it was not able to completely depolarize that neuron. So this is an all or nothing principle. Neurons depolarize to its maximum strength or not at all. Conduction of the action potential is um, a wave of opening sodium channels in sufficient numbers to allow sodium influx and depolarization. Um, the wave of depolarization or, uh, or a nerve impulse, okay? There is a refractory period and this is the time during which a neuron is insensitive to any more stimulation. So the cell is still in depolarization or early repolarization stages. So there's an absolute refractory period where during the sodium influx and early potassium outflow. And then there's a relative refractory period, which is the end of the repolarization period. So it may be possible to stimulate another depolarization at this point, at the relative refractory period, um, but it has to be quite um, significant to create um, a stimulus. So saltatory conduction, what is it? So this is a rapid means of conducting an action potential so remember the action potential is when um, the stimulus opens up that those sodium channels and dumps everything into the cell, into the cell, all the sodium into the cell, causing a positive charge on the inside and a negative cell on the outside, which is a complete opposite charge than its resting state. So this is rapid means of that. So depolarization in the myelinated axon can only take place at the nodes of Ren VA. So remember back in the other picture, I was telling you that neuron that has the myelinated sheaths down it, kind of like this picture right here, that impulse is actually going to hop over top of these myelinated sheaths and that action potential can only happen in the nodes of Ren VA and it hops, 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 hops. So you can imagine how long it would take for a stimulus to make its way all the and do all, because you can, you have to understand that there's a whole, this is, there's like hundreds, maybe thousands of proteins in this axon of the Na channels and potassium channels and the sodium potassium pumps. There's 
thousands running all along here and all of the opening of the sodium channels and the closing of it and then the opening of the potassium channel and the closing and then the re moving back of the ions from the sodium potassium pump that all happens here and then it, the message gets to here and then the message goes to here so you can imagine how long that would take to make its way all the way down an axon but thanks to these myelinated sheets these stimulations can hop and go from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier, quickening the process. All right, so we talked about what happens with the stimulation of the dendrites all the way down into the cell body, all the way down the axon, whether it's myelinated or not. Now, what happens at the end of the axon? So at the very end of the axon, there's a synapse, which is a gap, and that gap that synapse is between one neuron and the next. So um, there is a synaptic cleft, which is uh, the gap between adjacent neurons, a uh, presynaptic neuron, which is the neuron beginning the depolarization wave to the synapse, okay? So this, the presynaptic is um, the neuron that's before, right? Pre, and then that one is gonna receive an impulse and then um, what happens is when the stimulation gets all the way down to the end of the axon, it's going to release neurotransmitters, which is the chemical messenger, through that gap, through that synapse. And then it's going to make its way to the postsynaptic neuron, which is the neuron that's going to receive that thanks to its dendrites. And it's going to receive those neurotransmitters. I'm going to show you a picture that will hopefully make uh, help you visualize the synapse, but there's also something called tolodendrons, which are branch structures on the presynaptic neuron. So I don't know if you've noticed, but right at the end of the axon, there's these little processes that almost look like dendrites, but don't get confused. Those are not dendrites at the end of the axon. Those are called tolodendrons, and these are branches off of the axon. And on these tolodendrons, there's terminal buttons or bouton and um, at the at at the very tip of these tolodendrons where these boutons are found it's a slightly enlarged bulb and um, the synaptic end bulb and the synaptic knob we'll show you a picture showing you that and um, there's vesicles in the knob which are kind of like bubbles air bubbles right that contain neurotransmitters which are the actual chemical messengers for our nervous system. So when that axon sends a message all the way down its axon and there's all this depolarization that's happening all the way down and it reaches the tolodendrons, um, these vesicles will fuse with the knob's cellular membrane and spit out all the neurotransmitters that's in these bubbles into the synaptic cleft, okay, into the gap. And then those neurotransmitters are going to travel and make their way down to the next neuron. So this is a this is a very simplistic picture here showing you um, a neuron. So the message comes in here on the dendrite. It goes to the cell body. It goes all the way down the axon. I don't know why that's there in this picture, but um, the message goes all the way down the axon and then makes its way to the tolodendrons. And you can see that there's these knobs. Okay, and this within these knobs, there's these um, these bubble-like areas that contain neurotransmitters. And when the depolarization happens all the way down the axon, and the depolarization happens all the way up to here, it'll cause those bubbles or those vesicles to just spit out the neurotransmitters into a gap that's right here. And you know what's going to be right here is another neuron with its dendrites waiting to receive those neurotransmitters so that it can send the stimulus up its, um, down its dendrites, up its axon as well. So this is here is a beautiful picture showing you that gap. So neurotransmitters diffuse from the, um, across the synaptic cleft, which is the gap, towards the postsynaptic membrane. So these are the, um, the vesicles that I was telling you about, like these bubbles within the, the, the bulb at the end of, um, this is the axon going down to the tolodendrons, uh, and then your vesicles will have the neurotransmitters. So depolarization will cause them to make their way to the surface and spit out their neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters will float across 
the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft making their way to a little tiny receptor like a catcher's mitt on this this is a dendrite right here of the next neuron that's going to catch it okay so let's talk about these neural transmitters this is a pretty cool picture showing you a bunch of different neurotransmitters and their structures. So neurotransmitters fit into two categories. There's excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So the excitatory neurotransmitters are going to cause an excitatory effect. It usually causes an influx of sodium so that the postsynaptic membrane moves towards the threshold, therefore depolarizing and creating the impulse. Okay. Remember, we talked about that threshold. It needs to be significant enough to cause depolarization to make that impulse happen. But then there's inhibitory neurotransmitters, which move the charge within the postsynaptic cell further away from the threshold, and this will actually inhibit the nerve impulse. So there's different types of neurotransmitters, obviously. There's different types of chemical messengers. One of them is acetylcholine, which is the most commonly studied neurotransmitter. It can either be excitatory or inhibitory, depending on its location in the body. There's catecholamines, which there's three types of those chemical messengers, okay? And they're responsible for fight or flight. So norepinephrine and epinephrine are examples of this type of neurotransmitter. So they're associated with the fight or flight reaction of the sympathetic nervous system. And then there's dopamine, which is another type of catecholamine neurotransmitter. And um, another example of a catecholamine involves uh, another, yes, it's another example of the catecholamine and it's involved with autonomic function and muscle control. Um, another type of neurotransmitter is a gamma uh, aminobutyric acid, also termed as GABA, and glycine. So two, these are inhibitory neurotransmitters. The GABA is in the brain, glycine is in the spinal cord. So Valium or diazepam actually increases GABA's effects on the brain, therefore inhibiting activity and producing tranquilization. So that is exactly how um, volume works. It increases the GABA effects on the brain, which inhibits activity and therefore causing tranquilization. So next time you see a cat that's got some diazepam on board and it's half asleep or gorked out, you can understand that the volume increases the GABA effect on the brain. So those neurotransmitters will be increased in the brain. Okay, so remember we talked about the neuron, how it spits out these neurotransmitters? Well, the GABA ones will be increased thanks to volume. And because the GABA um, neurotransmitters that are, are getting spit out are inhibitory, so they inhibit the sensation or the, um, the message, it will produce tranquilization and stop activity in the brain. Recycling neurotransmitters. How cool is this picture right here? You can see the neurotransmitters tra traveling from bulb to bulb um, through the synaptic cleft. It's pretty cool. Once the neurotransmitters travel through the synapse and creates its desired effect, something then needs to happen to eventually stop that action. So for example, acetylcholinerase is um, found on the postsynaptic membrane, and this actually breaks down acetylcholine once it's, it's exerted its desired effect. So that's an example of how uh, neurotransmitters can be recycled or thrown away into the garbage because it's produced its effect, it's done, it's gone, we don't need it anymore. So, that's <laughs> all of that was just talking about how one neuron works. And, and that's that's quite, I, I hope you guys followed. If not, please do your, do some research and watch some videos to try to wrap your brain around it. But let's organize the whole entire nervous system anatomically, directionally, and also functionally. So the anatomical nerve, when we talk anatomically of the nervous system, we have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. That's it. So it's the center, okay? 
our brain and our spinal cord is our central nervous system. Everything that branches off of that towards our arms and legs is the peripheral nervous system, right? Our periphery. So it extends outwards from the central axis towards the periphery of the body. The cranial nerves originate directly from the brain. So they'll come right from the brain down into our body. And then there's spinal nerves, which emerge from the spinal cord. So these peripheral nerves will come from directly the spinal cord. So there's some that come from directly from the brain and branch down. And then there's some that come from the spinal nerves that branch down. This here is a very simplistic picture and I love it because I love keeping it simple. This is your CNS, brain and spinal cord, and that's it. This is our PNS, terrible picture, but I had a really hard time trying to find some kind of picture that depicted this, but it's um, all the nerves that come and branch off of the brain and the spinal cord. So let's, that was anatomically. Now let's talk about direction of impulse. Now you have to remember that these neurons will take messages from my hand and send it to my brain, but it will also send a message from my brain down to my hand. So you're gonna have afferent nerves and efferent nerves. The afferent nerves are the nerves that are gonna go from my hand towards my brain. So it conducts an impulse towards my central nervous system. Okay, so if I put my hand on the burner, there's going to be that stimulation of heat that's going to go up my nerves from my hand all the way to my central nervous system. These are also called sensory nerves. They conduct sensations from sensory receptors in the skin and other locations in the body towards the central nervous system. Those are afferent nerves. Then we have efferent nerves, which conduct conduct impulses away from the central nervous system. So the way a good way to remember this, efferent nerves, E is for exit. It exits the CNS and goes towards the periphery. Efferent nerves move away from the CNS, so they exit the CNS. Afferent nerves go towards the CNS. So efferent nerves that are coming out of the CNS is also called motor nerves because they cause skeletal muscle contraction and movements. So they, a message is sent up to my CNS saying, oh my gosh, this burner that I have my hand on is really hot. Then the afferent nerves are going to say, hey dummy, why don't you move your hand? So that message is going to get sent all the way down my efferent nerves, all the way to my hand to the point where, because it's, it's going to cause skeletal muscle contraction, that's going to make me move my hand off the burner. So that's all thanks to efferent nerves. Afferent nerves will send the message that, oh my gosh, it's hot. Efferent nerves are going to send, okay, we'll send the message, okay, we'll then move your hand. This all happens within like, like a, a split second so which blows my mind you know when you think about everything that we just talked about action potentials depolarization repolarization the sodium potassium pump and the channels and everything that happens in one neuron it just took me about 45 minutes to explain to you how one neuron works 45 minutes now you can imagine and but it's like like a split second like I can't even I can't even wrap my brain around what how much of a second it would take for all of that to happen in one neuron because when you think about it you put your hand on a hot stove it takes you what less than a second to move your hand so that means that all those thousands and millions of neurons there's thousands and millions of afferent neurons that sent that message all the way up to my brain and then thousands and millions of efferent neurons sending it all the way back down to my hand saying we'll move your hand this all happens within like under a second how amazing is that that's so that blows my mind to the point where i can't even fathom how this works um, cranial and spinal nerves in the peripheral nervous system and um, nerve tracts, which are bundles of axons put together in the central nervous system may carry nerve fibers that are sensory, motor, or both. So autonomic versus somatic. So the somatic nervous system is actions that are under conscious or voluntary control. 
I totally 100% control my somatic nervous system. I want to speak right now, so my somatic nervous system, I am voluntarily doing it. I want to stand up off my chair. Thanks to my somatic nervous system, I can do that and I control that. Except for your autonomic nervous system controls and coordinates auto automatic functions. You have zero control over your autonomic nervous system. So, for example, slowing of the heart rate in response to an increase in blood pressure. So, because of um, hypertension, you may have a slower heart rate. This is all due to our autonomic nervous system. We, ha we don't control that, okay? Um, our autonomic nervous system automatically does that. I have no control over it. My somatic one, my somatic nervous system, I do control, not the autonomic. So let's talk about the CNS. So the brain itself can be separated into four different sections. We have the, cere the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brain stem. And we're gonna talk about all those. And then of course, the spinal cord, which is the last part of the CNS. The cerebrum, which is depicted in yellow in this picture up here to the top right. It's, um, it's made up of gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is the cortex, which is the outer layer of the brain. And then the white matter is um, the fibers beneath the cortex. Okay, and these fibers connect the two halves of the cerebral um, cortex together. Okay, um, areas of the brain uh, sorry, the cerebrum is the area of the brain that's responsible for higher order behaviors, for example, learning, intelligence, awareness. This is all thanks to our cerebrum. And then we have um, the anatomy of the cerebrum. Okay, so we have something called the geary, which are folds in the cerebral hemisphere. So you can see the gearies here. These are folds. And then there's fissures, which are deep grooves that are separating these, the geary. There's something called a sulci or a sulcus, which is shallow grooves separating the geary. It divides the cerebral hemispheres into lobes, actually. And um, there's a longitudinal fissure, which is a very long line that separates right brain from left brain. And um, yeah. Then we have our cerebellum, which is the smaller aspect of the brain. Um, it's located caudal to the cerebrum, so it's depicted in red in this picture. It's the area of the brain that's responsible for coordinated movements, balance, posture, and complex reflexes. We have the diencephalon, which is the passageway between the brain stem and the cerebrum. Okay. Structures associated with the diencephalon are the thalamus, which acts as a uh, relay station for regulating sensory input to the cerebrum. There's the hypothalamus, which we've talked a lot about, and uh, this inter this is the interface between the nervous system and the endocrine system, right? Um, because the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary gland, which is also located in the diencephalon. And um, so those are the three structures that are located within this diencephalon. And this is a beautiful image showing you the diencephalon, and uh, you can see the pituitary gland dangling there, although I'm not really convinced that pituitary gland dangles like testicles, but it does look like it, doesn't it? Anyways, um, this is another beautiful picture showing the diencephalon and uh, showing you the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland there. So the brainstem is the connection between the rest of the brain and the spinal cord. It's composed of, a, of the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. So it's the area of the brain responsible for basic support functions of the body. Many of the cranial nerves originate from this area. And um, this will show you the brainstem right here, which is shown to you in red. Okay. And this is the brainstem here showing you the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. What are meninges? So meninges are a very important part of the central nervous system. And this is a connective tissue layer that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. So the whole CNS is hugged 
by meninges. They contain blood vessels, fluid, and fat. They supply nutrients and oxygen to the superficial tissues of the brain and the spinal cord. And they provide some cushioning and distribution of nutrients for the central nervous system. This here is a really cool picture showing you meninges and how they wrap themselves around this spinal cord here. So when you have meningitis, you have inflammation of this tissue, which you can understand how it affects you, how it affects your nervous system, because it will inhibit the spinal cord in the brain, which it immediately hugs. So there's three different layers to the meninges. There's the dura matter, which is the tough fibrous layer. Um, and then there's the arachnoid layer, which is a delicate spider web like, uh, which is in the middle there. And the pia matter, which is very thin and lies directly on the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. Now, um, so that's meninges. Let's talk about the fluid that's moving around the central nervous system. So um, cerebrospinal fluid is fluid found between layers of the meninges um, in canals and ventricles inside the brain and as well as in the central canal of the spinal cord. So throughout the whole CNS, there's fluid running through it called cerebrospinal fluid. This provides a cushioning function and it also may play a role in the regulation of autonomic functions such as respiration and vomiting. Now, there's something called a blood-brain barrier, okay? And what the blood-brain barrier is, it separates the capillaries in the brain from the nervous tissue. So the capillary walls in the brain have no fenestrations, so no openings. So um, it's covered by cell membranes of the glial cell. Remember the glial cell that I was telling you about? It's actually, it covers those fenestrations. So those capillary walls cannot, um, they prevent drugs, proteins, ions, and other molecules from just passing its way into the blood of the brain. So um, when we get into pharmacology, you start talking about that blood-brain barrier and how it plays effect in a lot of medication because these capillaries that won't allow drugs to pass through it, that can cause a problem with, with, um, with, some, with some drugs, right? So the drugs that can have an effect on your brain um, have to be specially made. So we did talk about the cranial nerves. Okay, and the peripheral nervous system are the nerves that branch off the central nervous system. And um, there are cranial nerves. So there's 12 of them actually in the peripheral nervous system and they originate directly from the brain, hence cranial nerves. They're numbered in Roman numerals one through 12. Each nerve may contain an axon or a motor of motor neurons, axons of sensory neurons or a combination of both. And this is a, a so it shows you um, all 12 of the cranial nerves and um, their function. This is another sh a picture showing you um, all 12 cranial nerves and where they come from. It's a really cool picture. Now, our spinal cord. We have the medulla which is uh, the central part of the spinal cord. It's composed of gray matter, okay? Um, the central canal is the center of the medulla, like you can see in this picture here. And then we have the cortex, which is the outside part of the spinal cord. And this has white matter, and it surrounds the gray matter. Now, what can be tricky is that in the brain, the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. The spinal cord is the complete opposite. The gray matter is actually on the inside and the white matter is on the outside. So um, there's dorsal horns in the spinal cord. These are neurons in the gray matter that uh, forward sensory nerve impulses to the brain or other parts of the spinal cord. And then there's ventral horns, which are neurons in the gray matter that forward motor neurons. Okay, so when we talk about motor neurons, we're talking about efferent. I'm looking maybe I should have mentioned this earlier. So sensory nerves are afferent nerves. So I sense that your hand is on a burner. 
Those are afferent nerves that are going to sense it all the way back up to my brain. After that, we're going to have motor neurons, so the efferent neurons that are going to make me do a motor, like um, move your hand, right? So um, these are nerves that send impulses um, to the spinal nerves to make me move my hand. The autonomic nervous system, let's talk about that. So the autonomic nervous system controls automatic function uh, at a subconscious level. We have no control over it. And of course, the subcategory to the subcategory, the autonomic nervous system can be split into two different sections, the sympathetic nervous system, which we have no control over, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which we have no control over, because both of them are part of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system nerves emerge from the thorax and the lumbar vertebral regions. Um, so it, it's the thoracolumbar system. And the peripheral nervous system, those nerves emerge from the brain and the, the sacral vertebral regions, so cranial sacral. Sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. Parasympathetic nervous system maintains homeostasis. So this here is just showing you where those nerves are branching off of our central nervous system. You have your parasympathetic nerves are up here and um, and then you have uh, and some down here as well. And then your sympathetic nerves are right here, all in the central portion here. So the sympathetic nervous system, the functions that it has on your heart, if your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, you're going to have increased heart rate, increased force of contraction, increased constriction of blood vessels, uh, bronchodilation in the lungs. Your GI tract is going to uh, decrease mobility, sphincter contraction, um, and decrease secretions. Okay, So that's what happens during your sympathetic response when you're being chased by that dinosaur. And this automatically just happens. Now, when your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, it's going to decrease your heart rate back down to normal, decrease the force of contraction back down to normal. It has no effect on the blood vessels. They just they don't constrict. They don't dilate. They just kind of relax to where they need to be. Um, in the lungs, you'll have bronchoconstriction as opposed to bronchodilation. Your GI motility um, it will increase your motility back to normal. Your sphincter will your sphincters will relax, and you'll have increased secretions in your GI tract so that it can do its normal function. Um, neurotransmitters and receptors, the primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system is norepinephrine. Okay, so the adrenergic neurons, so neurons that release norepinephrine. So these are the neurons in the sympathetic nervous system and they release norepinephrine. Epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine are also released from the adrenal medulla. So not only is it released from the adrenergic neurons, but also from the medulla in the adrenal gland. Um, blood vessels in the skin, GI tract, and skeletal muscles have adrenergic receptors, okay, um, to epinephrine and norepinephrine. So um, that response that will um, create epinephrine and norepinephrine relief, there's going to be receptors on the skin, GI tract, and skeletal muscles. So um, alpha-1, the adrenergic receptors, cause vasoconstriction of the skin, GI tract, and kidneys. Beta-1 are also um, adrenergic receptors, and they increase heart rate and force of contraction. Beta-2 also adrenergic receptors, and they cause bronchodilation. We just talked about all of those symptoms. We know that those are symptoms that happen during a sympathetic nervous response. So when our sympathetic nervous system kicks in, epinephrine and norepinephrine is going to be produced, which are the chemical messengers, and it's going to be produced thanks to the medulla in the adrenal gland as well as the adre uh, adrenergic neurons, and there's going to be receptors on the skin, GI, skeletal muscles that are all going to give the desired effect during that sympathetic response, like increased heart rate, decreased GI motility, whatever. And these are the receptors here that will take on that um, chemical messenger. So the primary neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. And um, these come from cholinergic neurons. And neuro these are the neurons that release, that release acety acetylcholine. So let's talk about reflexes and how the central and how our nervous system plays a role in that. 
So reflexes are rapid automatic responses to stimuli. Just like in that picture that we just saw in the last one, the doctor hits the knee right on that certain area and an automatic reflex, he will kick his leg up. And these reflexes are actually designed to protect the body. There's uh, somatic reflexes, which involve the contraction of skeletal muscles. And then there's autonomic reflexes, which regulate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and endocrine glands. So the autonomic reflexes we have no control over. Remember, autonomic, no control. It just automatically happens. The somatic reflexes, we can uh, it's our skeletal muscles that will contract, kind of like in that other picture there, caused a skeletal contraction, making his leg move up. So all this happens thanks to a reflex arc, which can also be a little bit mind-blowing. So there's a link there for you to try to understand um, this concept. So whether the somatic or the autonomic, it doesn't matter. All reflexes have the same structure called a reflex arc. So the reflex arc originates from the sensory receptors, which detects the changes within or, or, or outside the body. So the doctor hits the knee. Okay, so those are sensory receptors will bring a message and cause an act, uh, that sensory receptor sends an action, action potential. So it'll create the depolarization and uh, the repolarization will happen within those nerves, sending an impulse um, along the sensory neurons to the gray matter of the spinal cord or the brainstem. The sensory neuron synapses with another neuron with other neurons, the incoming sensory impulse is integrated with other impulses from other sensory neurons. The integrative response of the reflex is sent out by the motor neuron, which ends at the target organ, causing you to jerk your leg up or whatever that reflex may be. Now, if you don't get this, I suggest you do a little bit more reading in your book and watch that video. There are a lot of reflexes. I keep referring to the doctor that hits that knee, but there's a lot of them that we use on a daily basis in veterinary medicine. Uh, we also do the knee jerk reflex, but also um, palpebral reflex arc. So this is a light tap on the medial canthus of the eye, so the medial corner of the eye, and this produces a blink of the eyelids. So in a totally awake animal, you tap that corner of the eye on the medial aspect and the animal will blink. If the animal is under a proper anesthesia plane, so they're completely under anesthesia, they're not feeling anything and the doctor can go ahead and cut open the abdomen, there will be no palpebral reflex arc. And that's what we're looking for when we reach a good anesthetic depth no palpebral reflex arc. If we do, then the animal is still capable of getting those signals to the brain and realizing what's going on. And we don't want that, obviously, during anesthesia. Um, there's something called a pupillary light reflex, which is the normal response to shining a light into the eye of an animal um, for the to see the pupil constriction. Okay, so shining of the light in one eye also causes consensual constriction of the opposite eye. So when we're checking to see eye function, we'll take that um, or any ophthalmologist or you take your ophthalmoscope and shine it into the eye. There's going to be a light, and what we're looking for is your pupil to constrict, and that is called the pupillary light reflex. So if all is working well, that should happen. In some cases where there's neurological deficits, that doesn't happen, which means that there is no neurological message being sent from that pupil up to the brain. And then there's also pedal reflexes that we commonly use during anesthesia. Um, you pinch in between the toes and that reflex will cause them to pull their arm back or their paw back. And um, when they're completely under anesthesia, that reflex is completely missing, which means that they're not able to get that message due to uh, being anesthetized, which is what we're looking for.